It was common for the ancient Greeks to think of their city-state as the pinnacle of human political achievement. Aristotle, a student of Plato, and perhaps the first to embark on a comprehensive and systematic study of political systems, asserted that it was in man's nature to belong to the polis. It was in the polis, the Greek city-state, that man fulfilled his rational nature through the enjoyment of what he called the good life. The rise of medieval civilization, and subsequently of Christian thought, meant the rejection of this worldly orientation that the Greeks were quite known for. For St. Augustine, for instance, earthly life was inherently miserable, and it was only in the city of God that man fulfilled his true nature and attained salvation. It was in this context, in light of this otherworldly turn, that St. Thomas Aquinas achieved his great synthesis, a towering philosophical edifice that reconciled ancient Greek learning and Christian theology, and indeed, reason and faith. This was an important advance, because salvation now consisted not in the abandonment of earthly life, but in linking it to God's divine plan. Aquinas agreed with Aristotle that the polis and the good life it made possible were advances in human social evolution. He insisted, however, that by living the good life, which was life befitting a rational creature, man was ordained to a much higher end, which was the enjoyment of God. Similarly, Aquinas did not reject reason in favor of faith. He argued that reason and faith were both divine in origin and that no real contradiction exists. Contradictions were the result of the frailties and limits of the human mind. Within this synthesis, science could be appreciated as an enterprise of observation, discovery, and contemplation of all of God's creation. As Father Billy Swan noted, Aquinas helps us understand the amazing intelligibility of the universe that most of us take for granted. Why does the math of our minds resonate with the math of the universe expressed in the laws of physics? This question was not lost on scientists like Albert Einstein, who once remarked, the most incomprehensible thing about the world to me is the fact that it is comprehensible. The rational creature can find his way to faith, although acknowledging the limits of the human intellect should be prepared to submit to the guidance of faith should reason fail him. The same hierarchy was present in Aquinas' notion of law. Human law was derived from reason or natural law, which was itself part of the eternal workings of the universe authored by God. Eternal law. Divine law was the revealed word of God in Scripture. Natural law was the rational creature's participation in eternal law. And human laws are derivations from natural law. Human laws are thus, first and foremost, ordinances of reason for the regulation of human conduct and directed to the common good. Laws are made because the precepts of natural law are general and these need to be applied to specific situations. It follows from all these that not everything that has the appearance of law are in fact true laws. This great synthesis also became an important pillar of theocratic rule, the union of church and state. If human laws were ultimately derived from natural law, and natural law was the rational creature's participation in eternal law, and God himself was the author of eternal law, then politics cannot be separated from religion. The realm of political rule was integrally fused with and subordinate to that of faith, and thus rulers were subject to the guidance of the church. Thomistic philosophy endures to this very day. Its argument for the unity of reason and faith 
forms the bedrock on which the Catholic Church anchors its teachings on many contemporary issues. In an important sense, it was also this solid philosophical foundation that allowed the Church to wither the many crises that engulfed it in the course of its history. This foundation gave the Church the doctrinal solidity to withstand the corrosive effects of modernity and a fixed point from which to navigate the vagaries of history. We can say that this embrace of earthly life as a stage in our journey to God is what fundamentally informs the teaching mission of the Church. Earthly life was not inherently miserable on account of the original sin. Instead, it provided opportunities for the rational creature to participate in divine wisdom through reason and faith.